Online friends, good morning. It's great to be back with you. Uh, I apologize about uh, last week missing. Uh, myself and the family were all down with the COVID. So uh, last Sunday at Nexus was Sports Sunday. We had a whole bunch of people doing reflection on sports, but I had to miss last week. So that is why I was not with you here online last week. And I'm still trying to get over this. It's uh, been a little bit rough uh, this past week, but hanging in there. Glad to be back online with you, and uh, this morning's a bit of a different one because uh, Nexus Live, we're actually having our very first Soup Sunday. Our very first Soup Sunday, for those of you not familiar with what it is, it's like Nexus's version of the potluck, except it's all soups, so many different soups, everybody's showing up with soup, and it's, ooh, it's so delicious, it's tasty. And so what I thought I would do is a sermon on Soup Sunday. Now, again, if you haven't been with us for one of these, some of this might be a little bit foreign to you, but uh, I'm sure all of us have had a potluck, so you could think of it maybe that way, but this is a sermon, an ode to Soup Sunday, you could see, and uh, that we haven't been able to participate in a Soup Sunday at Nexus in over two years is no small thing. Uh, it, it's a significant thing, probably the favorite thing that we do at Nexus. I love it because the earliest people of the Jesus path, what they believed, of course, was that through Jesus, the world was being reconciled and put back together again. And for them, this was the interesting thing. The best way to experience that reconciliation, it wasn't via a sermon, much to my chagrin. It wasn't through worship music or liturgies or anything you do on a Sunday morning. No, for them, the best way to experience God's reconciling work in the world was collectively gathering around a table for a meal. And so that had me thinking about Soup Sunday. I mean, I'll ask you for a moment here to consider what it means to eat together. Now, I don't know how many of you know my wife, Kristen, but the trouble with her is essentially this, is she's just too nice. Uh, I remember years ago, her and I were on an all-inclusive vacation, and uh, I think it was Cuba, who knows, I can't even remember where it was, but we land, you know, we get off the plane, we're heading to the resort, we get there, and then there's the check-in, right? You gotta wait for a little bit for them to get organized, get you your keys, so on and so forth. And we're standing in line, and of course, we just want to get to the beach, get some drinks, the buffet. And so we're waiting in line with all these other people, and what does Kristen do? Of course, she starts making friends, chatting it up with other people waiting in line. And, uh, I, I mean, listen, I, I like to be friendly with people, but in lines, I, I don't know, I, I'm not interested in making friends. So she starts talking with this couple in front of us, British couple. And they get to chatting, they're teachers as well, like Kristen. And, and sure enough, they're chatting, having a great time while we're waiting. And as we get our keys and we both head our separate ways, Kristen says with the sort of, you know, little smile, twinkle in her eye, uh, maybe we'll see you around the resort. And I really wish she hadn't have said that. I, I think they took this as an invitation because sure enough, that very night, Kristen and I sitting down to our first meal, we're at the buffet, seated, the two of us got our plates full, and this couple that we met in line, they walk by, we wave, they wave, and they get some sort of inkling from us that we'd like some company because they say to us, do you mind if we sit down and join you? And uh, Kristen, of course, said, sure, of course, sit down, and now I'm having a meal with these two strangers, and uh, that was fine maybe one night, but not even kidding you, the next night they come and have dinner with us at the buffet again. The third night, Kristen and I are at this a la carte restaurant. We're sitting there. What are the odds this couple shows up again? Oh my goodness. A third dinner together ends up happening. Of the seven nights we spent there, five nights we ended up having dinner and supper with this couple and I hated it. And I know what you're sort of thinking, perhaps, Brad, why do you got to be such a curmudgeon all the time with people? And, you know, maybe I'm a little more grumpy than usual getting over this COVID here. So give me a little bit of grace here. But I think the reality is this. Uh, we have social mores in our culture around sharing meals. And one of them is this. You don't share a meal with strangers. 
And so all uh, these five nights, Chris and I had dinner with this couple. I mean, they live in Britain. We're not going to be friends. What, are we going to be pen pals? I, I was just grumpy the whole time because I'm thinking there's, there's no relationship going to develop here. They live an ocean apart. And so you're making small talk the whole time trying to, you know, find commonalities. And, and, and it reveals within me how much I adhere to our social more that we don't eat meals with strangers. I mean, you don't go to your favorite restaurant, right? Looking to make new friends. You don't go to a restaurant and when you sit down, ask the people beside you to pull up their table. We don't eat with strangers. For us, when we think about meals, it tends to be friends, very close friends or family members, right? We don't eat meals with strangers. In fact, we don't even really eat meals with acquaintances. Sharing meals today is reserved for those who are very close to us. We have borders, you could say, around who we share meals with. And you know, it was the same in the first century world, you know. They had their social mores, and they were sort of more pronounced than ours, but they were there as well. And so men and women never ate at the same table. A slave would serve their master, but would never join them. And of course... You have good Jewish people, people like Jesus and his disciples, who are expected to never be caught dead eating with a Gentile, someone who wasn't of their ethnic tribe. And so what happened is mealtime became the primary expression of reconciliation within the early church. For them, it was the revolution. And I think this is worth pondering on. The radical call of the early church, it wasn't to march or protest or rage against the system of the day, dismantle the systems of the day. Those things, of course, have their place. But for them, no, the radical call of the early church was for men to dine at the same table as women and then help clean up the dishes afterwards. It was for a Jew to sit with a Gentile and try to make small talk. It was the radical call of masters to be seated at a table next to their slaves and serve them wine. These meals in the early church, their love feasts, for them, they were radical protests against a world of division. And I mean, this is why uh, the Apostle Paul was so insistent. He wrote in Galatians, right? There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There's no such thing as male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus, he says. And, and the early church's call, their mandate, was to break down divisions and barriers. And for them, the most practical, tangible way for that to happen was by removing barriers around meals. Which brings us to the potluck, or soup Sunday, you could say. You see, to me, soup Sunday, it's not just a cute little thing we do at the side here at Nexus. It's not just our little version of the potluck. To me, it is the urgent moral work of breaking down divisions and barriers by eating together. Because although we don't have, you know, sort of men, woman, slave, free, Jew, Gentile thing happening, we still have social mores around who we eat with. I mean, think about it this way. Think for a moment about the number of people you would honestly share a meal with in your home. Or how many people would you actually accept an invitation to go out to a restaurant to dinner with? I mean, how many people are actually on that list? My guess is, if you think about it carefully, your dining circle is probably pretty small. I mean, family, of course, for sure. Probably some close friends. For those of you in the business world, there's maybe a transactional thing that happens with, with you know, potential clients, something like that. But in large, our meal circles are fairly small, reserved for those we love. It's an intimate space. And so one of the things I'm intrigued about with Soup Sunday, with potlucks in the church, is they're perhaps one of the only places where the borders of intimacy around sharing a meal are actually extended. And so in the act of Soup Sunday, we eat, of course, with friends here at Nexus, yes, but in a community like this, we also eat with strangers, acquaintances, people who think very differently than we do. And so what Soup Sunday is, what the potluck is, it's us taking our humble place in a 2,000-year-old Christian tradition where we, as a moral protest against the divisions in this world, share a meal 
with those outside the borders of our moral mealtime intimacy. And so you could say this, the very first thing to know about Potluck's Soup Sunday is that it's an act of protest against the rampant spirit of division in our world. But second, Soup Sunday is also an expression of unity, not uniformity. Soup Sunday, you could say, is a celebration of diversity amidst unity. Now, of course, virtually every church will talk about this having unity as a thing, you know, we do as community. So, you know, virtually all churches talk about this, but the way that some churches hold and practice this is by insisting on a unity of beliefs. And so there's this idea, you know, you sign up for a church, you you read their little belief statement, you got to sign off on that. It's this idea that we got to ensure that everyone who belongs here agrees on everything and expresses their faith in the same way. And I got to be honest, there's some wisdom to this because it gets messy when you don't necessarily have that because there has to be a center, a common path or objective for a community, you could say. But the impulse of this is not unity, it's uniformity. And so you could think about it like this way. For some churches, the best way to have unity is by insisting, say, that at Soup Sunday, everybody bring chicken noodle soup. It's like, okay, listen, we're about soup, but we got to be on the same page. We can't have people, you know, with varying soups here. So everybody bring chicken noodle soup to Soup Sunday. Now, granted, you can have a wide variety of chicken noodle soup. I mean, I've tasted some very different ones and. They're all delightful and delicious, but they're still all of the same order, right? And and the way many churches express unity is by ensuring everyone stays within the bounds of soupdom by ascribing to chicken noodle soup. But for us here at Nexus, Soup Sunday is an amazing expression of diversity within unity. You see, the thing is this, the early church, it wasn't looking for uniformity. If you you remember to two weeks ago, we explored a few weeks ago how the early church handled this divisive issue of meat sacrifice to idols in these local churches that could be very different in their beliefs and expressions, right? For one church, it was this. The other church, it was this. And when Paul announces, right, in his, uh, in, in Galatians, that there's no longer Jew, Gentile, slave, free, men or women, what he has in mind here is hierarchies. He's not thinking about the actual eradication of differences. The early church, of course, continued to be very different in their expression, even as they were being pulled into a larger story. And so Soup Sunday becomes a brilliant expression of that. If you've ever been to Nexus on a Soup Sunday, so many different soups. And so you could say this, we do have a center at Nexus. For us, it's the Jesus path. Like Soup Sunday, the center is soup, right? You know, there's, we're doing soup. But within that, there's incredible diversity. I mean, you can have lobster bisque. Cream of mushroom, cream of broccoli. I'm a big fan of the creams, soups. That, 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 that's my kind of go-to. But what you've got when you show up to Soup Sunday is a diversity of soups. Soups you've never even heard of from all over the place. And what I love about Soup Sunday, if you've ever been there, is there's always that person who shows up, right, with mac and cheese or meatballs or something. And they're like, well, I'm not sure if this strictly fits under the Soup Sunday mandate, but we include it, Right. All of it can fit. I'm sure, you know, mac and cheese, that can count as soup. Meatballs, kind of. Why not? And so what Soup Sunday does is it reminds us of the rich diversity of soups found in the soup world. It reminds us of the rich diversity of people that are among us at Nexus and how each one, despite being different, has its place. And it contributes to the whole. It nourishes the whole. And here's the thing, it's not that we need at Nexus to be the perfect beacon of diversity. We're not that and we never will be that. But the reality is this, what it reminds us of is that we can expand the borders of love and affection beyond what we already have amidst the differences already present at Nexus. And Soup Sunday offers a model of that. It reminds us that we can have differences and still be unified. Soup Sunday reminds us that we can be unified without being uniform. Everyone doesn't have to be chicken noodle soup. There's a wide variety of flavors. Some soups are spicy, some are comforting. 
whatever it is, there's a place for all of it. And so Soup Sunday, potlucks, they remind us of unity without uniformity. But finally, Soup Sunday reminds us that we have something to offer this community. All of us have something to give. All of us have something to bring to the table. I mean, consider the difference, if you will, of an experience of eating at a restaurant, say, versus eating at Soup Sunday. Now, everyone loves to go to a good restaurant. Of course we do. And it's Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, mothers. Uh, but why do we love to go to good restaurants? Maybe some of you are going, you know, to one today. Well, what's not to love? I mean, generally, you eat better food than you eat at home or can make at home. There's no prep. There's no cleanup. I mean, a beautiful meal just arrives right in front of you. And so what restaurants do is they offer a predictable experience. A server delivers to you exactly what you ordered. And, and there's a very clear line, right, between who is serving and who is being served. And the best part is when the whole thing's done and you've got this big plate of mess on your table, you just get up and walk away at the end. It's glorious. And the thing is this, even if you have a bad experience at a restaurant, you got options, right? You can send it back to the kitchen you can demand something better. You can be passive aggressive and leave a one star review on Google ratings, right? Whatever, you know. But moreover, you don't even have to return if you don't want to. You don't have an allegiance to a business or a restaurant. At least you don't have to. We love restaurants because they are the ultimate consumer experience. We show up, get served, and then walk away. Let the establishment do the dirty dishes. Now consider, if you've ever been to Soup Sunday, consider the nature of Soup Sunday as opposed to restaurants or a general potluck in mind will do. You show up and you have no idea what's on the menu. You know, if you're in the mood for a burger, you're going to be out of luck, right? But Soup Sunday teaches us a lot about the nature of church or what church should be like. And first thing it does is teaches me this. I don't always have to be the one giving. Sometimes I can just receive. Now, this isn't like a restaurant where you, you decide what you want as an individual and you don't get to return your food to the, to the kitchen, nor do you get to leave a poor Google review at, you know, Soup Sunday, whatever. That would be kind of hilarious. But it isn't a restaurant experience where you're in control, but it does remind us that we don't always have to be the ones giving. Sometimes we can just receive. And I would say this. This is what I like about Nexus's soup Sunday experience as opposed to the traditional potluck, right? Because with a potluck, everyone's expected to bring something. But I don't know about you, sometimes in life that just feels too much, right? Like this Sunday we're doing soup Sunday and if somebody had asked me to bring soup this week, I would just would have been like, I can't do it. I, I, it's, it's a miracle I have a sermon ready, I can't do it, right? Sometimes we're in a stage of life where we just have nothing left to give. And so the beauty of Soup Sunday at Nexus is people take turns giving, supplying the soup. You can just show up and eat. You don't have to bring something. You don't need to feel guilty if you show up and like, oh no, it's Soup Sunday, I forgot. No, that's all taken care of ahead of time. That's the nature of life. Some seasons we're ready to give but for all the seasons and times of life when it feels beyond us to give, Soup Sunday reminds us you could just show up and receive. That's fine. Others can carry us. Show up. There will be soup for you. Come, eat, feed, be nourished. We don't always have to be the ones giving. We don't always have to be the ones serving. Sometimes we can just receive. And you know, there's a humility about that. There's a deeper lesson in that as well. I mean, you have no idea what you will be served at Soup Sunday, but you accept it with gratitude. And why? Because, listen, my favorite soup is lobster bisque. But the reality is, even if that's not there on a Soup Sunday, chicken noodle will nourish and feed me just fine. Not every Sunday morning, not every song, not every boomerang group, not every experience at Nexus at church will be your favorite, but you can receive it with gratitude, knowing that even if it isn't your favorite, even if it isn't a life-changing experience, it's still going to nourish you. And you know, I used to really struggle with this as a pastor because I used to think that every sermon on Sunday that I gave had to be just, boom, above board, 
totally impactful, life-changing, and it, it felt like so much pressure for me. And I remember talking to my father-in-law one time. He's like, hey, do you remember what you ate for dinner uh, two weeks ago on Sunday? And of course, I'm like, no, no recollection. I have no idea what I ate two weeks ago on Sunday. He's like, that's precisely the point. You don't remember, but it still nourished you. And not every experience is the same way with church. Not every experience that nexus needs to be some fine dining Michelin star French onion soup, right? No. Some sermons, some experiences in church, eh, they're more chicken noodle soup from a can. But it feeds us. It nourishes us. It gets us by another week, another day. And so Soup Sunday reminds us that there are times when you can come and just receive. You don't need to make the soup. You weren't asked to. Just come, receive, be nourished. No, maybe it won't be a Michelin star restaurant soup. It might be chicken noodle from a can, but it nourishes you. And yet, and yet, Soup Sunday also reminds us that all of us do have something to give and bring to the community. Because here's the reality, if you stick around long enough around Nexus, eventually you will get asked to bring soup to Soup Sunday. Eventually you come to Nexus, you can lurk around in the shadows all you want, but eventually someone will ask you to bring soup to Soup Sunday. A church is not a restaurant. We don't get to just keep coming and receiving. Stick around long enough and you will get asked to contribute and you have something to contribute. That's the life of community. Eventually we'll get asked to bring something to the table and so the question is, what kind of soup is your specialty? I mean, listen to the, the words of Paul speaking about the different way we bring things to the table as a community. In 1 Corinthians, he says this. I'm not going to put it up on the screen this week. But he says this. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone is the same God at work. Or in Romans 12, he says, we all have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. You know, some folk, it cracks me up. They spent way too much time trying to figure out what Paul was speaking of. They get all in this dither. What's my spiritual gift, right? And you can go and take these classes online to figure out is your gift hospitality or teaching, whatever it is. And it kind of makes me laugh because people in my mind are way overcomplicating things here. Paul isn't forming an exhaustive list of gifts in these passages. He's making a point. Everyone has a gift at something. And whatever that is, you bring it to the table of community as an act of service. Eventually, you'll be asked to bring soup on Soup Sunday. So... Friends, online friends, how can you contribute? What can you bring to the table? Uh, that's a good question. What are you good at? You know, maybe there's a way, even though we're just online here, it doesn't mean that you can't be part of the community. I really believe that. So the question is, what are you good at? And whatever that is, that's your spiritual gift. And let me say that again so that it's clear. Whatever you are good at in life, that is your spiritual gift. So bring it to the table of community. And granted, this can take a level of discernment because I'll be honest, someone like me, I happen to think I'm really good at a lot of things and I don't think that's probably the case. So sometimes it takes discernment to figure out what we're good at, but everyone's good at something. Everyone has some gift or service or soup to bring to the table. So at risk of overstretching the metaphor, what soup, what dish can you bring to the soup Sunday of Nexus, you could say? Think about your gifts. Think about your personality. Think about the, the unique person God has made you to be. And consider how you might best serve the community by bringing what you have. You have something crucial to offer. Without your soup, metaphorically speaking, our soup Sunday will never be as rich as it could be. 
every time you're at a soup Sunday, you think, my goodness, I'm so glad that soup was there. Every time we don't bring our gift to the table, the gift of soup Sunday is a little bit poorer. And so like soup Sunday, if you stick around long enough, you'll be asked eventually to bring your gift, your soup to the table. But let me close with this. Eventually you will be asked, but you know what's even better than being asked? Offering without being asked. You know, it's easy. It's interesting because Sarah organizes all our Soup Sunday shows. She goes around asking people if they can bring soup. You know what makes her job a lot easier? When people go up to her and say, hey, can I bring soup to Soup Sunday? Don't wait to be asked. I think it applies on a broader community level, right? We need your soup. This isn't a restaurant. We need your help. And if you stick around long enough, we'll ask for it. By why wait for us to ask? Why not offer it up? If your thing is music, talk to Dave. He could use your help there. There's so many different places we could use help at Nexus. And what that looks like for those of you online, I'll be honest, I don't really know. But we can at least start the conversation, open up the dialogue. So let's dream together a little. Let's think about what we can bring collectively to the table so that we're acting in a way that protests the division of this world. Let's bring our soup and gifts together so that we are expressing unity, not uniformity. And let's bring all of our gifts to the table so that we as a community are richer for all the gifts brought to us. Friends, thank you for joining us. If you're like, man, I'm hungry for soup right now. Listen, if you're in KW, there's still time. Come and join us out at Steckley Farm this morning. We would love to have you. You don't need to bring anything. The soup's already there. Come, eat, feed, be nourished. But if not, friends, we will see you next Sunday. Until then, go in peace.